Support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, partnering with donors from all walks of life to improve southeastern Virginia through grants, scholarships, and leadership initiatives. Learn more at hamptonroadscf.org. Hello, everyone. This is Barbara Ham Lee. Up next on Another View, thoughts on current events and a look back at 2022 with the Another View Roundtable. We'll talk about the political strides of African Americans this year, the frustration of continued gun violence in this country, the determination to overcome racism, and the hope for tomorrow. Dr. Alvian Lyons, Don Hester, Carol Pretlow, and Gaylene Knoyton are at the table, and they are truly y'all ready to mix it up (laughs) stay tuned another view will be right back after this national regional and local news from npr and whro news Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Oh, you do not believe how much holiday spirit is going on in this studio today. It is a wonderful thing. <laughs> so on what, what end of the spectrum do you sit? Are you happy that in a couple of weeks, 2022 will be over? Or are you in dismay because this year has been so very, very good to you? Well, one thing is for sure. It has been a complete ride. Here to share their thoughts are our favorite peeps, the members of the Another View Roundtable. Uh, Dr. Alvian Lyons it is our resident people person. She specializes in human dynamics and interactions. And you know what? We haven't seen Alvian in two months. <laughs> and guess what? She's sick, y'all, but so she is joining us by Zoom and by phone. But Alvian, we are so happy. We can actually see your smiling face. So we are so happy you're back with us. Listen, I love you guys so much and I'm so excited to at least be with you virtually. I mean, you know, we've we've got to do the responsible American thing. If you have symptoms, stay home. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate that very, very much. But we're really glad you're with us, Alvian. She's all about keeping the city of Norfolk fiscally sound. Don Hester is the treasurer for the city of Norfolk. Hey, Don. Hey, everybody. <laughs> You've been with us all along, girl. You just hang in there. We appreciate that. I love it. She has committed her life to uh, influencing and guiding the lives of young college folks. Carol Pretlow is a professor of political science at Norfolk <laughs> State University and literally just sat down in the chair. Are you okay? I'm fine. <laughs> We're happy you're with us. I said I can't miss this discussion, not today. <laughs> well, we appreciate you being here, Carol. And she's known as the ultimate connector. Anything community, Gaylene Knoyton is the go-to person. She's a political <laughs> consultant and president of the Hampton NAACP, among many other titles that she holds. Hey there, Gaylene. How you I, doing? Let's get, let's get it going. <laughs> <laughs> I revved up. We got a lot to talk about. Yes, and we do. So, And you know what? You know, the best laid plans, because you all know I come in and I produce the show and decide what topics first and so forth. And then, guess what? Brittany Griner just got out. She's on her way home, yeah. y'all. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Just some initial reactions, Gaylene. I think it's past due, but we understand the climate that we're in right now. And Putin, it was his decision to release her and not both and not Mm -hmm. the uh, not the other gentleman. Um, Paul Whalen. Yeah, Paul Mm Whalen. And and he has his own reasons because he wants to release other people. So he so he has other people that he wants us to release. And he want to play political warfare. But the most important thing is the reason why Putin wanted to release what they call him. They call him the merchant. What the death? Yeah, the merchant his name of death, is um, the merchant of death. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All he wants to say his name. He's a merchant of death. The reason Victor why Bout. they wanted to release him, um, Putin wanted him because he knows where weapons are abroad that yeah. Putin needs. 
mm-hmm. for this war that he's in now. Mm, Carol? Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. Uh, he was playing political poker, mm-hmm. and he wanted to negotiate with Ukraine about the Ukraine situation. And fortunately, Biden hung true and tough on this, and we got her released. She should have been released. Yes. <laughs> She should have never been ago, Because yeah. actually she did nothing that some people in this country don't do. I mean, a small amount of marijuana. I mean, that's ridiculous, but I'm glad she's home. Don, I'm just glad she's coming home. Yeah. I think they have said everything. Um, what a Christmas present for her wife, huh, Alvin? That is correct. Yes. That's exactly the thought I had. The words that stuck with me is that our family is, is whole that we're whole again. And we forget sometimes in the midst of all of these things, just the human element of it all, that your person has been gone for 10 months, you know, unjustifiably on top of that. So Mm -hmm. I am happy for her wife that she has her person back in the midst of all of this tragic chaos. Mm -hmm. And I mean, just thinking about the the trauma that she had gone through, because we don't, and what Brittany went through also, we don't know what actually has happened to her Mm-mm. it's in her incarceration so anyway it's a it's a good news day that way so ladies democrats increased their majority in the u.s senate with the re-election of <laughs> senator raphael warnock of georgia but election night was a roller coaster ride with warnock and challenger herschel walker going back and forth back and forth on the lead don just give me your initial reactions as you were watching i went to sleep did you really How could you? <laughs> i went to sleep <laughs> In the beginning, I told my husband to wake me up when more data came in (laughs) because it was tense. Mm -hmm. I felt confident that he was going to win, that Warnock was going to win. Mm -hmm. But I have um, tried to make sure I maintain my mental health and the tenseness of the situation and the up and down of the data coming in, how it comes in, and realizing the stress that, you know, was not only on the country, but just on Georgians and the work that they had to do to get people out mm-hmm. to vote. I'm so grateful, of course, that Warnock won, that we keep the senator who um, knows what he's doing in that seat and mm-hmm. the difference that it will make, I believe, for all citizens in the country because the Democrats will be able to get some legislation passed, some more meaningful legislation passed that mm-hmm. impacts our life every day. Um, but yes, I had to go to sleep, but then I woke up and it was like, <laughs> now I can go have a peaceful sleep because <laughs> the results are in. Gaylene, if it were not for that um, um, Fulton County, Atlanta, you know, that area um, in terms of African-Americans kind of pushing it over the top, that map still is really, really red. Even though I know they say it's a purple state now, but... It was because of those areas that kept my sanity that night. <laughs> <laughs> You're exactly right. But, you know, one thing that um, the Republicans banked on is that all the Republicans were going to come out and vote for Herschel Walker, and they only needed a certain percentage of black folks to vote for Herschel Walker. It's unfortunate that he got over a million votes, though. I mean, that is... I mean, we are still fighting crazy. You know, and that's unfortunate Mm -hmm. that, you know, and that's the reason why all of Trump's candidates didn't win because they were all off the grid. Yeah. 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 Do people understand what you're saying when you say off the grid? I can't even say right all the way right because I, I you know, I got some good Republican friends. Right? <laughs> I, I, you better not. I did too. But they, just they were the crazy. election they were the deniers. Yeah, election deniers. Yeah, they were the election deniers. Yeah, yeah, so election deniers. Yeah, That's right. They're not trying That's to right. do it uh-huh. to serve for the right reason. Right, right. exactly. Right. Alvin, what, what was your night like watching? You know, I started, I, I started to feel like I was channeling my husband because I was standing in front of that television like my two, my, my team was playing and the <laughs> ultimate rivals of my team were playing at the mm-hmm. same time. I'm yelling at the screen. I mean, like truly, because I was in disbelief that this was actually a competition. That yeah. was the thing that mm-hmm. I, I just mm-hmm. really struggled with. I could not believe that we were really having this conversation from a national and political perspective like Mm -hmm. how can you you know i I was going to say some unkind things let me my mom said if i don't have nice things to say i probably (laughs) 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 
Oh, come on. <laughs> You're but, come on. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but you know what? I'm, and there's an issue I want to get to in just a minute as soon as I get Carol's reaction to her just watching that. But I think it's where you're going, Alvin, in terms yeah, of, of some of the frustration absolutely. around this race that, um, that people of color, I think, understand really well and others may not. Um, yes, so, Ka- But Carol, let me get your oh. initial reaction of watching. Well, my initial reaction was that it was going to end up like it did. First of all, I was wondering as I looked at it, I said, I'm not going to look at the whole thing, but I did. And <laughs> <laughs> I kept saying, what was it about this man, Walker, that would lead the Republicans to get behind him. And then I said, you know, you learned it when you were a little girl. He's black and any black figure, they just like, oh, he's black. Let's support him. I don't think he had intelligence. He certainly was not articulate. He didn't address the specific issues of that district. There was nothing about him. If he had been white, they would not have liked him at all. And I'm sorry, that sounds racist, but that's how I felt. That's how you felt. Okay. And that, that's your feelings. And that's what, what we're asking for. Well, there was an incredible opinion piece. It was written in The Atlantic by Caroline Randall Williams. Now, she's a poet, host of Discoveries, Hungry for Answers, and a writer in residence at Vanderbilt University. And she talks about in this article about how the Republican Party used Herschel Walker. Mm. She calls his candidacy, quote, an American tragedy. And I want to read an excerpt from the article and get you girls' reaction on the other side. Uh, She says, quote, Walker stands up at podiums and I feel shame and sorrow and resentment. He is incoherent, bumbling, oily. He smiles with a swagger that does nothing to distinguish his total ignorance of how blatantly he is being taken advantage of by a party that has never intended to serve people who look like him. Walker's candidacy is a fundamental assault by the Republican Party on the dignity of black Americans. And that is a conversation that has been going on in the black community um, in particular about the whole idea of putting someone forward in a major political party who who clearly did not have the wherewithal to answer the call. Um, Alvian, let me get your reaction first. It hurt my feelings that as a woman of color, and I don't view the whole world just through my race, so for anybody who's listening and wants to get offended by that, you know, hear this for what it really is about, okay? But Mm -hmm. it hurt my feelings to see us represented on the national stage in that kind of way. And let me be clear about something. One of the luxuries we don't have as people of color is to be individuals. We are Mm -hmm. often characterized as Mm -hmm. a collective. So we bear this collective responsibility for the way that we represent ourselves to the masses. And while that is not true for our, you know, white counterparts, it is very much our reality. And even when not spoken, we understand that when you get the opportunity, you better not shame us. Mm -hmm. It's very much inside of the culture. So to see a man who is a caricature of all things negative as a person of color, he represented in reality everything that we fight to be sure that we are not and that we are not labeled as. And somehow the party that was once noted for being the party of morality and family values as the narrative was written somehow has gotten behind a man who is everything but that. Mm. And the only thing that he represents a value is that brown skin. That was it. And the, and the fact that I have, you know, I have lots of very good friends whom I love, some family who are Republican. So this mm-hmm. is not just an R and D and I conversation. Exactly. But I had one call me and say, I think that it's such a shame that people of color are are tearing down a black man. I said, let me be clear about something. People of color are not tearing down a black man. People of color are saying that that is not who we are. Mm-hmm. And there is a difference. Mm, absolutely. Don? What more can you add to that? <laughs> <laughs> well, he answered the call. The Republicans called. Walker answered the call. 
because all he had to do was push the button that they told him to push, whether it be yes mm-hmm. or no. And that's all they wanted. Mm-hmm. They wanted a man of color. They found him. They found him. He was available, and he allowed himself to be used by mm-hmm. the Republican Party for what he thought, I guess, because I can't think for him, because yeah. I don't think there was any thinking in it from him. <laughs> he allowed himself to be used. That's a problem I have, even in the black community, because as people of color, we sometimes allow ourselves to be used and we know we being used. And it's to your personal benefit, but it's but not, not to, to the, the benefit, benefit of-, of the group mm-hmm. or the community. And, and that's been happening for many years but for the Republicans to put it out so publicly Mm -hmm. and for a man, because he's a young man, to not understand, know, or care. I have a big problem with that. Gaylene. This is a conversation I do have. I can have some very frank conversations with my Republican friends. And it's in the culture, you know, that it's like they have no respect for black people. If you look at in leadership, they only got really one major person, and that's uh, Tim. Tim Scott. Tim Scott. Tim. That's it. So why haven't they? And they don't even use him as a leader. Exactly. They don't lift him up and use him as a leader. He's not the Barack Obama of the um of the, of the Republican, Republican Party because mm-hmm. they want to keep him exactly where they want he him. is, right mm-hmm. there in that South Carolina area. And so I asked, why? Why is this? But this is something that's been going on forever. It's just that when Trump came in office, he took the, sh- he, t- <laughs> you he know, exposed. you know what I want to say. Yes, he, he exposed, exposed. <laughs> <laughs> what was Show going on. Real. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Carol, let me get your okay. response. <laughs> well, I have several things. Once when I talk to my students about. I did not have one student that said, oh, yeah, Herschel Walker is the man. Not one. And that's unusual because even when Trump was running, there was a divide there. Mm -hmm. Okay, not one. The other is, you know, I tell my students I learn a lot from them. They said, you can tell he don't know what he's talking about, (laughs) the way he goes off in conversations that have nothing to do with the direct question. And the fact that if you ask about one specific issue, he didn't know, he, he would go off into these hypos about what had happened to him. Um, so I think we were relieved that he didn't win, but surprised that he got the amount of votes that he did. Yeah, and that that's the, the scary part. Is, yeah. is it not? I mean, he, I mean, it could have been Mickey got, Mouse, and Mickey Mouse would have got a million votes. Probably, <laughs> probably a better candidate. <laughs> <laughs> but Alvin, let me go back to you as our resident, um, you know, humanist. <laughs> but but I really I really want you to to explain to to our audience because we know that our audience is predominantly non African American. Um, right, this whole right. idea of the collective versus yeah. individualism. Um, because that is something that is very, very real in our community. It's been that way for, you know, always. I don't think there's mm-hmm. been a, a season in our community where we have not been judged as a collective. And and so right. mm-hmm. can That's you delve true. into that a little bit more for me? Yeah. And and one of the more one of the most effective ways that I've been able to have this conversation, particularly and, you know, I spent a lot of time in law enforcement. Right. And mm-hmm. doing leadership training and development inside of those spaces. And I talk about it from I said, let's just take black out of it for the sake of this conversation. Let's just pretend that you're the first female chief in the United States, what you understand you represent because you are the first, you are the only, you Mm -hmm. know that to have gotten into that leadership position as a woman is an unusual experience. One might say it's an honor and a privilege. Others might say that we should all have the same opportunity as a man to be able to reach to those heights. But regardless of what perspective you come from, every woman in that position who gets to that position, any woman who gets to that position, understands that how she handles herself there is going to impact the decisions that are made about other women getting to those levels. So 
the fact that we can understand it from a gender perspective, for those who believe in a binary notion of gender, Mm -hmm. um, is the same way in which we can lay that reality on what it means for people of color. We are in 2022, and we are still having firsts. The first Mm -hmm. black blah, 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 fill in the line, Mm -hmm. firsts in 2022. So as a community, we recognize that because of the numbers alone, there is a unique responsibility we have to ensure that we conduct ourselves in such a way that we open the door wider for more of us who are competent and capable to be able to step into these spaces and do what we were predestined to do. And when we see someone take that space, and I don't care what they're doing, if there are enough cameras on it, we instantly feel a sense of responsibility and accountability to the whole because the mm-hmm. numbers are and the margins are so thin. So the reason why we, we get funny about what happens when you're a person of color and she knew better and he knew better and when Will <laughs> smacked them, I mean, all of that, we, we take mm-hmm. all of that stuff personally. It's because we, we are such a small margin in mm-hmm. these success identities that we mm. really feel the enormous mantle that is is connected to that. And everybody understood it when President Obama became president. That man couldn't sneeze in public That's because true. he had to remember that he was the first and everyone will be judged by him after him. So that is why we are so embarrassed by Herschel Walker, because that is everything we've been trying to prove to America. We are not. Mm. Well, well said. Well, well said. said. <laughs> well said. But Next. <laughs> Before we go move on to the next topic, let's talk to Sarah in Virginia Beach. Hi, Sarah. You're on the air. Hi. I just wanted to say I'm a 74-year-old white woman, and I agree with everything you've been saying. I just think it's a disgrace that he ran as a Republican or that he ran at all. And, and I follow these things, and I, I just agree with what you say wholeheartedly. <laughs> we appreciate Thank you listening, and Thank we appreciate you. your agreement. That's Thank right. you so much. Well, speaking of first, um, Congressman Hakeem Jeffries of New York just elected as Democratic Minority Leader, taking the place of Nancy Pelosi, first black person ever to hold mm-hmm. that position, mm-hmm. right? Along with uh, Congresswoman Catherine, Catherine Clark of Massachusetts, elected as whip, and Representative Pete Aguilar of California as chairman of the party caucus. So now for the first time, we've got a, in, in terms of Democratic control, we've got a rainbow of minority mm-hmm. <laughs> in leadership. Um, so is this the beginning of the future, Gaylene? I hope so. Um, I think that... Um, Nancy Pelosi, he's got some big shoes to fill, but she ain't mm-hmm. going nowhere. Right. She gonna, she's going to be there. She ain't going nowhere. Yeah. You know, so she'll, she'll be there to help shepherd him along, and he's got support. But he's a smart young man, too. He's he very, is. very smart. Mm-hmm. I think that, um, yes, you'll see, you'll start start to see more doors open up. I mean, this president, President Biden, has done more than than any president has done in terms of promoting people of color, mm-hmm. you know, and if you look at, like I said, we can go with, you know, the SCOTUS, Kentaji Brown, you know, being the first, Jackson Brown being the first SCOTUS uh, appointed, you know, and how many judges, federal judges has he done of people of color? He didn't appoint over 102 federal judges. Yeah. And, it's, wow. hey, right. and it's a portion of the people of color, <laughs> you know, so, you know, we're not talking about that piece of it, but I think that he's, the, that the doors are opening up we just have to keep pushing we can't we can't sit down we can't lay on our laurels yeah. we just gotta keep pushing mm-hmm. we gotta keep it going yeah. so and and you know i it, speaking of him being very an intelligent young man there is an article i was looking for the name of the um author but it was in the washington post and they were talking about um uh, congressman jeffrey's first press conference mm-hmm. and he spent in his column probably the first three paragraphs talking about how the congressman uses his hands. What? Yeah. Saying, you know, in other words, the gestures that he made during his press conference. And then finally at the bottom of the article, he says, Oh, but you know, I think he'll, he'll be okay. I think he'll be a a good, 
Oh, a wow. good uh, leader, but you know he use he chops to the left, he chops to the right, he points his fingers. He go, you know, I was so mesmerized by his hands that I Did missed that, that, I, that I had to go back and listen to the transcript to find out what he said. Okay, well, I mean, that's... again, is that marginalization, Alvian, of of who people are and what they are, you know, about? Well, I would ask, <laughs> are you equally as impressed when you talk to your Italian friends? Because I grew up with Italians, and you want to talk about people who communicate their love, their thought, and their passion with their hands, Italians. I do the so same thing. Curious, I mean, <laughs> I, yeah, I'd be very curious to know: are you are you unable to sit in an Italian restaurant and and order food because you're just so impressed and amazed and mesmerized by all of the hand movements? I just I just find when you have an opportunity to be able to speak to the substance of a person and you choose to speak to something so superficial, I just wonder what it is that you're valuing. I you know, wonder, like, excuse me, I wonder why they let it print. You know, it's, it, he's, somebody, he's a columnist. He's a columnist. So, so he's, he's entitled, it in entitled to his opinion. But, but it, 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 it smells or smacks to me again of the marginalization of people of color in particular that comes from all different places. And, you know, some people say, well, you, you're just being too sensitive. You know, so, you just, mm -hmm, but, right. but it means something, right. especially in, in the Washington post. That's a national. Yeah. So, yeah. And, one, and one thing so, that I have learned that if I see an article like that, I will send a note to that reporter. And sometimes they don't see the other perspective. Now, I'm sure he probably did see the other perspective, but sometimes they don't see the other perspective. So if you just be quiet and just read it, then you're just sitting on yeah. the sidelines. I always pick up the, either pick up the phone or I'll send a note. So my question, because mm -hmm. I'm not in journalism, mm -hmm. and it came from a columnist. Right. Why did it have to be printed? Why did it have to be put well, in the paper? They're, they're, it didn't have to be. I mean, but they okay. they are they are entitled. The mm -hmm. columnist is entitled mm -hmm. to write his or her opinion. Mm -hmm. So that but, was his or her opinion, and right. so and that's fine. You know, I agree with that because yeah. we all have our own opinions. Mm -hmm. But why did that paper have to print it? That you'd have to, like Gaylene said, we need to okay. write this. Write them up. That's, that's that's right. Right. If you're just joining mm -hmm. us, we're talking current events with the Another View Roundtable. Relationship expert Alvian Lyons, Norfolk City Treasurer Don Hester, political science professor Carol Pretlow, and president of the Hampton NAACP, Gaylene Conoyton. Um, ladies, I want to talk about now another a wonderful achievement in our community. And that is that the Virginia Symphony Orchestra has named Dr. Andrea F. Warren as president and CEO. She is the first black woman to serve as CEO of a leading symphony orchestra in the United States and Canada. Mm, mm, mm. Wow. Okay. Hello. Now, in full disclosure, my company, Sharing Info LLC, along with Susan Fight Consulting, served as DEIJ consultants with the symphony for three years, helping the organization embrace diversity equity inclusion and justice and I just want to tell you I'm happy as I could be I mean but but this is a major major milestone for the symphony uh, Alvin I think it's always fantastic when we are realizing how multi-dimensional people of color are we've spent so much time in very specific places we've often been hidden um, our stories erased from the broader narrative or certainly edited in such a way that they are less potent than they really are in the power that has been represented in the way that we have worked to live our lives out loud and mm -hmm. with some measure of dignity associated with that that it's always a beautiful thing for the rest of the world to be able to see what we know and talk about at our dinner tables and, you know, during the holidays, the things that we celebrate and find joy in, the way that we clap when we find out we just had a mayor in Arkansas, 18. 18, black. yes. Okay? <laughs> like the, that's, and while folks are like, oh my goodness, I've never, I would never, oh my goodness, just in terms of just the excitement, I don't mean that in a negative way, but just mm -hmm. the excitement over that. And we're thinking to ourselves, our community is filled with brilliant young black men, but that's not what gets the news, right? right. That's yeah. not the story that's told. So it just brings me joy when more of the truth 
is being shared. And we're not just some face for the suspect we're looking for instead crime. Mm -hmm. That is not who we are. That represents the smallest minority of our community. It's just beautiful when we're seeing something other than the lie. Absolutely. And Dr. Warren was the um, uh, head of uh, the um, Governor's School for the Arts prior to, and then she said she was retiring. So she, and then she, came back. Say, she came out of retirement <laughs> to do this. And um, I'm glad that she did. Yeah. I'm so grateful that she did. And, you know, a lot of people may not know her, but then clearly a lot of people do know her Absolutely. for her to get this selection and for her to want to even do it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, people may not know that her daughter, how accomplished she is yes. as an actress. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know if that's the right word. Actor. Um, because she's in Tina on Broadway. Yes, she is. Yeah, so you know, <laughs> and, and she, and yeah, the whole family, because and family her husband is, is a, um, a pastor, a pastor. Right. right? And yeah. and now I realize for the Virginia Symphony, this is going to be a financial thing for them because they're going to expand their base. You know, I'm on the board of the Virginia Air and Space Science Center, right? And one of the things that um we um that we learned about there's a program called Museums for All, mm -hmm. where um. People can, where if the museum roll, enroll into it, then SNAP and um, SNAP recipients can get, use their EBT card to get into a museum for $2. That's going really? to expand the base. It's going to teach more people to get into cultural arts. The symphony is going to get more uh, people of color, black folks want to go to the symphony and learn about the symphony because they see someone that look like them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's been one of the things that they've been, they've been working on because mm -hmm. they recognized that their audience was, was very segregated. I mean, mm -hmm. um, right. and that they wanted to be able to expand. Um, they're doing other things also, mm -hmm. but this hire of, of uh, Andrea is just, just incredible. Yeah. Do you know her, Carol? Have no, you ever I met don't, her? but I was, I was so excited when I read about her and thought about the Virginia Symphony and said, wow, I'm living to see this because I never thought that this would occur. And I was just so excited and interested in saying, well, now I got to go to the Symphony because I haven't <laughs> right. gone. Well, you know, I was excited when they hired Thomas to be, you know, yeah. their conductor. Thomas Wilkins. Mm -hmm. and, um, but then this added to it and... Sunday night, the symphony and my church, the Mount, um, did a concert mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. So that was like the dress rehearsal. But this is now going to go to the Jefferson Center, mm -hmm. to Chrysler, mm -hmm. and to the Sandler. Mm -hmm. And it is a marvelous Christmas concert. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, so they're doing what they said. And, you know, she was there, of course, and mm -hmm. so was the young lady who's a diversity person yes. that yes. they brought on mm -hmm. board. But then I will say to the community, Symphony might not be your thing, but the music is wonderful. It's and I love the symphony. It's fabulous. Yeah. And I'll get a membership now because they have taken a step. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think it's a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And so if you take one step, then I'm going to step with mm -hmm. you. That's right. And so that's what we have to do mm -hmm. to support mm -hmm. yeah. them. Exactly. So we do need to come out and support them. Mm -hmm. And Gaylene, I know that you were at the um, going home services for uh, Congressman Donald McEachin, um, who Talk about him because he was a giant that we lost in from our community. He was a the gentle, general community, he was a gentle, gentle um, giant. He was mm -hmm. a, in the House of Delegates. He was a, you a senator, and then he moved on to um, Congress. But he was a gentle giant. He was a fighter for criminal justice, civil rights, and the environment. I mean, he was big on the environment. And I mean, he was like our go-to person, and, and he he knew everything about that. But he was also personable. So when you go, when you're talking to him, it's like you're the only person in the room. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. always give you good advice. And the turnout for his home going yesterday was second to none. It was a, it was a beautiful service. Um, you had the um, Speaker Pelosi got up and said that was the largest delegation, congressional delegation that she's ever seen in her 35 mm. years mm -hmm. at a service like this. Wow. And mm -hmm. um, Reverend Kenny, he brought it in. <laughs> uh, you hear me? He brought it in. <laughs> and he was looking dead at the governor when he said it. I was like, woo. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he did. He, he it was it was just a beautiful service all the way around. And every um every branch was represented and it was a great send off, you know, and we just mm -hmm. send our um 
our condolences to Colette and, you know, his family, his wife yeah. and Colette and his family and everything else because that was a big loss. But big he stood as long as he could. Yes, he did. And he was still he was still texting all the way up to the end. Wow. You know, he was mm. still fighting all the way up to the end. Yeah, we did a tribute on him for uh, about him last week on last week's show. So if anyone missed it, you can go to anotherviewradio.org and mm-hmm. listen to that tribute. Um, so, okay. <laughs> What are we going to do about gun violence? What are we going to do about gun violence? Wow. I mean, because we, since we've been together, since, since the last time we were together, we've mm-hmm. had the Walmart shooting. We had the shooting in Virginia Beach with police officer. Um, this was that last week. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are countless people who have been uh, shot. shot. Let me let me not use hyperbole. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. There have been many people who have been mm-hmm. shot in our communities across Hampton Roads. Um, what oh, what can we do? Anybody who wants to start? I just Gaylene. well, let me just say this. I think that first of all, the assault weapons. <laughs> who needs an assault weapon? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> first of all, I believe, or oh, I think that even though the um, Walmart is, the, if that ge- if that young man would have had three days before he could purchase that assault weapon, things might have went another way. You know, it could have went another way. Mm-hmm. I think that that has to come back into play. Mm-hmm. That wait, that the waiting wait. period. Mm-hmm. But the assault weapons, I mean, it's like anyone can get one, eighteen and up, really. The ages need to be raised as well, too. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then the the Virginia Beach shooting, you know, I know it's still under investigation. But both of them had guns, didn't they? Yes. The one, when I the, say one, them, the, the, the people in the car. The people in the car, the yeah, couple. Both yeah. of them had cars, mm-hmm. key, um, guns. So um, we can deal with the gun violence piece by not allowing so many Assault weapons, I just do think they need to be banned as well. Mm-hmm. The wait period has to be a part of that. Red flag domestic issues, that's all got to be included in it. But I think we need to start looking at people, at us, and how we begin to invest our money in helping people to be whole, to feel whole, to not be in situations where others put you down and you just sink it and it stays in you. Mm -hmm. We have to do more and that costs more and it takes more time. Um, But individuals who are giving like the people in um, the group in Norfolk who are walking the children at the bus stops, they're giving of their time to make sure that children get home, at least to decrease the gun violence Mm -hmm. during that time of the day. Mm -hmm. We've got to do more of that. I think sometimes people think they have to do something grand Mm -mm. when it really is a building of each one do something to to make things happen. But Alvin, I want to ask you a question, because one part of the conversation about the Walmart shooting, once again, is the whole idea of um, accountability of companies when there is a problem, an employee problem. And so there's a lot of pushback from companies saying, well, you know, we can't run around. There's nothing we can do. And there is yes, something can. they can do, there isn't is. it? Mm-hmm. Alvia? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a, it, to be honest, it's a very complicated situation, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, none of us want to see this happening in our communities, no matter what community we're, you're talking about. Mm-hmm. But we have not been able to legislate our way out of it. We have not been able to pray our way out of it. We have not been able to medicate our way out of it. And it's because all of those things are true at the same time, that we cannot take one angle in how we're approaching this. The ownership has to exist at a multidimensional level, right? There, we have to make sure that we're effectively, because one of the things we're not, we have not been actively talking about as we're discussing the root causes associated with gun violence and, you know, the traumas mm-hmm. associated with that, but what is fueling some of the traumas? Well, when you've got people who are completely marginalized in the community for whatever reason that is, be that economic or whether that's race-based or whether that's gender-based, the Hope changes things. And when you have no hope, then everybody's life is worthless. 
including your own. Mm -hmm. And when we change our, and I'm not blaming the education system as a whole, but when you're talking about this much violence, you're talking about a systemic issue. It's not individual when it's this frequent, right? So what in the system is changing that is making this possible? Well, we know gun accessibility. We've talked about that many times. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that I would argue is when we became the society that only values education, from a four-year degree orientation to determine your worthiness and your contribution to society as a whole, we missed something major inside of that. Because let mm. me tell you something. On During Thanksgiving, if your toilet is stopped up, let me tell you the most valuable person you can think of <laughs> is a plumber. I don't. I, I. The only PhD I need is plumbing has been done. Okay, the <laughs> key, the H, and the T. Okay, like so. When we started doing this thing where everybody has to have a terminal degree, everybody has to have an MBA, everybody has to graduate from school, we took away dignity from people who just exactly. wanted to work hard each day and be able to take care of their families. And when our mm. schools stopped doing shop in schools, we stopped doing trades in schools, we stopped doing the things that made it possible for people who were not meant to be stuck behind a computer and their their nose in a book, but could wow. build extraordinary things. We changed the landscape. So I mm. maintain that there is more that can be done. But those are root issues, and we have to bring back things that we thought were unnecessary and that we have chosen to undervalue as a society because in so, in so doing, not only did we throw away those options, we threw away those people. And it, and threw away those hope, very, the hope yeah. from there. Absolutely. I Absolutely. agree completely. Carol. And it is difficult even when I'm talking to my students and see how they react to – um, people who are maintenance workers or bus drivers. And I'm telling them that from my personal perspective, I learned political organizing from a lady that had a seventh grade education. And everybody in my community loved Miss Amy Palmer now. And she <laughs> she actually charted out communities as who lived in the community, what their affiliations were, and what their voting interests would be. And it wasn't about a degree. And what baffles me about the degree scenario is that as soon as you get one step, then they add something else. Now, when I was in college, get your master's degree. Okay, you get that. Oh, no, 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 PhD. <laughs> then you get that. Oh, postdoctorate. And it goes on, even mm -hmm. in the legal community, JD, LLM, SJD. I was like, what is that about? <laughs> We need to go from the ground up and respect everybody's I think that's a systemic mm -hmm. change uh -huh. because I think everything, there's a system. I think that's one of the things that was intentionally done as people of color, women, okay. started taking these steps. So you cut certain things out. So then you begin to diminish a group so that you don't climb up that ladder to be up there with everybody else. So mm -hmm. our school systems, when the technical part was taken out of schools, mm -hmm. that was not, and, and we still have technical education. Yeah. yeah. It's just yeah. different. It's just mm -hmm. different. It's just mm -hmm. different. But when it was diminished, I'll use that word, when it was mm -hmm. diminished and people were, it was not being pushed um, to students to be able to have that choice, then you begin to change the whole spectrum, as Alvian said, about thinking about what is what you want to do. But and, and, your and, and, and let me and let me mm -hmm. just say this: mental health is one, and gun violence they work together. You know, so you know you have you know like our governor, he just talks about putting more money into um, behavior mental health. He's not mentioned one thing about gun legislation, not one thing about that, and 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 it works together. It can't be one or the mm -hmm. other. It has to be both. To Alvin's point, you've got to attack it on many different sides exactly. from many exactly. many, many different, different perspectives. Levels. But you know what? What is the common theme behind all of our conversation today, guys? Dignity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Dignity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it it comes down. Go ahead, Carol. Well. 
the same thing, well, the dignity portion of it is what I am trying to tell my students. Yes, I respect your having knowledge. Okay, you pick up a textbook and you read it and da-da-da-da-da. But what I want them to learn is how to respect everybody's position in that. You don't get to be president without engaging with voters. And that doesn't mean you say, oh, I'm only going to engage with certain classifications. Now, what the problem is, is that in the electoral system, and you know better than I do, Kelly, is it's how much money can you add to a campaign? I mean, as black people, we never had a whole lot of money to participate in campaigns. We need to, okay, you all do your thing, but we're going to do ours, and we're going to start on the grassroots level. We're mm -hmm. going to organize in churches and community groups, and all, and we can provide basic education about how legislation is passed and who should represent us and why they should represent us without the big... And then today, with all the people on the Internet and all that, which I don't understand real well and my <laughs> students have to help me with that but the very fact that they can help me understand how to blog and how to text and all of that means mm -hmm. that that's a valuable resource you don't need a whole lot of money for a campaign go to the internet <laughs> and, and i can speak from experience i have never been able to raise a lot of money one because i don't like to ask people for it because i think <laughs> that if you think i'm good enough you should just give it to exactly. me okay so that's just me <laughs> However, I, yeah, I know, baby. You know, I know. I'm I gotta, you got to do. Head, you know, I'm you got my head. call time. You know, you got to do all that. But just think. We wish it worked you know, like that. Yeah. I've been elected since 1996 mm -hmm. because I love and respect the people that I serve, mm -hmm. and I am among them. I know mm -hmm. what they tell me, what their needs are, and I'm always going to be there for and you. That's it. And that, for me, has been how I have continued to be reelected in all mm -hmm. these different roles. So it's, but that's also a part of how we strengthen our community. You have to know people. You have to. And you have to respect to, people yeah, where they you know, are. And, and if I you can help them the go to a next level, that's take fine, one family, but respect and, it. That's take right. one family, and within your own adopt family. one family, even within your own your family, because you know, we got <laughs> issues in our own families, you know, that we have to, you know, you take one outside of your family and say, I'm going to help this and family grow. we got to mm -hmm. be very suspicious of those people that we only see at election time and we don't see Correct. all the time. We mm -hmm. have some problems at Norfolk State. Well, how did you know about it as you came there? And you come there all during the week or maybe for a basketball game, not just in election season. And that's what really angers me, to get yeah. emails from people that I'm like, where were you last week when well, people didn't have money for textbooks? It's it's when you know during election time when people when the politicians go to black churches, mm -hmm. yeah. we never see them again until mm -hmm. the next election cycle. Okay, we're almost out of time, and I've got to hear from you all. What are you hoping for in twenty twenty three? What's what's your wish list? Let's. I'm gonna start on this end with you, Carol, and go back around. Wow. It's difficult because I say that I have enjoyed what I've done so much that I just want more of the same <laughs> with um, not so much expense attached to the same, but <laughs> just more of the same. I enjoy what I do. Okay. Gaylene, what are you looking for? On a political side, I'm hoping that um, our elected officials can find common ground and work together and work for the people. I really want to see that. I want to see that fake news and all that is gone away and, mm -hmm. and everything that Trump has brought to the table is gone away and we get back to having dignity in our government, number one. Number two, in my community, I want to see more people are united. Uh, I want more uh, respect for each other, you know, and within our community and within our families. Mm -hmm. Don, I want peace everywhere because it's the the world, not just our country, mm -hmm. but the world is um, changing. And um, because we have had so much turmoil, not only in the United States, but it all kind of started when we started and everybody else just has just kind of continued to evolve, that I would like for... And all of the countries 
for people to find some peace, for leadership to be able to, for us to talk about it more. Mm -hmm. Because when you have peace in your spirit, then that gives you more opportunity to talk with people who are not like you and find that common ground that Mm -hmm. we're looking for so that we can make rules and decisions that will impact lives all across this world. Mm -hmm. Because it's not just about the U.S. anymore. Mm -hmm. Everything that we think about in our decision-making is global. Yeah, and when it, they say we're yeah. a global society, it's, right. it's for yeah. real. So, we, <laughs> so that that's the one one piece. Mm-hmm. And then I just want people to be healthy. I want you to go to the doctor. That's and don't right. be afraid. That's right. Get, get some health the insurance. The more you know from the doctor, then the better you can take care of yourself and have a better life, whether that's your physical health or your mental health. I don't want us to be, I know I'm going on or I got to give Alvin some time. Mm -hmm. Mental health is a big thing, yes, because there's so much trauma of all kinds that we do need to let people know it's okay to go ask somebody to to talk to somebody so you can try to get your better footing in your life. And for me personally, I just want to be healthy and be able to continue to serve. (laughs) That's great. Alvin, you get the last word. (laughs) <laughs> the last two and a half minutes. <laughs> okay, well, you got to share too, Barbara. <laughs> well, for, for me, it's it's actually personal growth. My, my hope for 2023 really isn't about what happens outward as much as it is about what happens inward. And so there are two things that I'm working on for the coming year. One, in my personal life, I'm working on radical acceptance. And what I mean by that is to be able to fully and completely accept the people that I love for who they are, not who I wish they would be or who I believe they can be, Mm. but truly for who they are so that we begin our relationship from the place of knowing that you are seen and valued already and you leave this space feeling whole for everything that's going to try to make a withdrawal from you outside. So that for me, from a personal level, Mm -hmm. in in home, from an out of home space, I want to do the things I'm afraid of. That in Mm -hmm. 2023, most of the ways in which we need to make change in this world requires that we got to step into something that makes us uncomfortable and perhaps even a little bit scared. And so for next year, I am going to challenge myself to do the things that I'm afraid of, the things that I'm uncomfortable with, because those are the things that are most likely going to make the most difference in a life that is bigger than my own. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so my 2023 is start with you. And we've been been trying to get her to run for office, so maybe that can can happen (laughs) next year. (laughs) She got too much on the plate. She got too much on the plate. Maybe that uncomfortable thing will happen. I love you, Haley. <laughs> ah, so a future politician <laughs> is on our Zoom screen. That's another world girl. Talk to me first. first. <laughs> I've been running well, from that for a decade, okay? She'd be good running at it. Running for a decade in the opposite direction. She know I have. <laughs> Wise woman. Oh, gosh. Well, for me, I just hope that COVID and RSV and the flu and everything yes. else that people will pay attention and mm. do what is necessary mm. to protect yourselves and don't talk about other people because they decide they want to wear their mask or they want to be <laughs> do things that are protective of themselves. And I just wish and, and hope that we all can get along, along. as Rodney King says. Yeah, <laughs> you know what? Let's all get we, along. And <laughs> we've see had each a long other. time. And see Absolutely. each other. Really see each Audience, other. Audience, thank you so much for spending an hour of your life with <laughs> us and for all of your comments. We You can listen to this show or any of our shows at your convenience by going to our website, anotherviewradio.org and downloading the podcast of your choice and while you're there don't forget to sign up for our eview newsletter it's a once a week reminder of upcoming shows next week on another view how to make a successful holiday movie and have it air on network television a great conversation with local filmmaker booker t madison great norfolk state grad yesterday is our theme music is an original composition created especially for Another View by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Jordan Christie is our audio engineer. And Dr. Barry Graham answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Be sure to join us again next Thursday at noon. And thank you so very, very much for listening to Another View.
support comes from Hampton Roads Community Foundation, carrying out your charitable wishes forever. Whether it's helping shelter animals, feeding the homeless, enhancing the arts, or supporting students. Learn more at leaveabequest.org. 